be excited to be in higher education and proud to be in higher education. I'll say a little bit about, uh, about my history in a moment, uh, but I need things to boast about. It's pretty much as simple as that. In quite a lot of my job, uh, you deliver. I, uh, Chris Ever was kind enough to invite me uh, last week to, to view the new uh, Xu Bing exhibition, and it was just, I, I sneaked in actually, I was quiet and I uh, just observed, and it was fantastic, truly, truly uh, fantastic. And uh, although life is difficult, uh, we've got so much to celebrate and be proud of, and Chris Smith gave us uh, that message last night. Now, it's now 8,101 days since I arrived in the university sector, having previously worked in, uh, in research, uh, and I entered a backwater. Higher education in 1991 uh, was a backwater. It wasn't really growing much. Uh, the funding under the, the days of uh, Lamont and Major, uh, the funding was always <coughs> under challenge. Uh, we were never in the papers. Uh, not quite, a bit more than half the number that go now to university were going to university. And of course, we were about to go through uh, all of the binary divide uh, stuff, which was controversial and which in some places remains controversial today. Uh, I thought I was settling in for a nice, quiet job in a university for years to come. Uh, and in fact, of course, universities expanded tremendously in the 90s. It saved my university from going bust. It was pretty much as simple as that. Uh, a prime example of how between Raw Holloway and Bedford to do a merger that's underfunded and lines with an even bigger problem than the two you had before, but growth did. <laughs> growth did. We're twittering, are we tweeting? For goodness sake, I'm trusting you to be careful. Because <laughs> I do the honesty and bluntness bit. If you tweet it all, uh, I won't be going to conferences and doing the honesty and bluntness bit because I won't be in the job. Uh, so, I, you know, unfunded mergers disaster uh, and uh, growth got us out of it. But of course, since then, universities have been on the front pages, uh, principally through fees. We've almost brought two governments down, or to put it another way, two governments have been willing to risk uh, their future in Parliament in order to reward us with fees that allow us uh, to keep the quality of our education up. And there are other ways to put that story, but nevertheless, uh, governments have put themselves on the line for us. We've ended up on the, actually on the front pages of the paper most days for two years, certainly more, every week uh, on the front pages, uh, pretty much every day uh, for uh, two years in the press. Uh, we are now a, a really much more important part of society just as so many people go, but we're also an important part of society because in many parts of uh, the country, universities are the only part of the economy that is in any way prospering. We are the major, I'm afraid in crude terms, the major economic actor in so many parts of the country. Uh, the recovery of the country depends on the engagement of universities with the society around them, certainly e economically, but also given uh, the savage cuts that have been made uh, through other government departments and agencies, uh, socially and culturally as well. And universities are generally in a reasonably strong place, as uh, Nick Rafael will say a bit more. Uh, so we're really, really important, and we didn't used to be, is the summary, and we haven't all adjusted to the fact that, first of all, we've got, I think, just take note of everything we do of the importance that we have in society, but also the responsibility that comes with public funding to be a bit more outward looking, captured as Nick said in the Impact Agenda, that's half my talk gone. Uh, we've got a responsibility to discharge that public funding. Uh, university, museums, galleries, collections are doing that. And uh, again, I don't need to dwell on it because um, Nick mentioned it. What about the future? of higher education. It, and I, I, again, Nick, you, you got the, the guts of it. It is about, in my view, quality. Uh, the future depends critically on attracting students from overseas. We are the seventh biggest export industry in the UK. 
said, I mean, I, I just think that's stunning. We are working in something that is that important out of the country. Tweets off, despite the best efforts of government occasionally to stop us <laughs> from being successful export industry. So I, we're really, we're really important, but we only do that on the basis of quality. We've seen in other countries when they have unfortunate events happen that undermine the quality, the perceived quality perhaps I would say of a higher education uh, rather than necessarily than the, the actual quality, numbers just plummet. So we've got, uh, first of all, to work hard uh, with our marketing and our perceptional stuff, but have that uh, solidly underpinned by the demonstrations of high quality in our teaching and of course in our research, I sort of take that for granted. And so it is, I think now, in the increasingly competitive market for home students. We've got to demonstrate that indeed for a very considerably increased fee, we are offering an experience to the students that is intellectually enriching as well as equipping them uh, very often with immediate skills for the, uh, the workplace, but more particularly giving them the flexibility of thought that enables them to adapt throughout their career to the changing uh, needs of business, industry, the third sector, and so on. So if we can't do quality, we're stuffed, I think is basically it. If, uh, one of the things you do, I think, is be at the heart of high uh, quality teaching and also research. All of that's great stuff, but balanced with the, uh, the success of what you do, there's the continuing challenge to get funding. We are in uh, the most stunning museum in the country, certainly uh, one of those uh, <coughs> wonderful set of collections, uh, a program that just makes your jaw drop when you see the ambition there is. But I strongly suspect that Christopher spends quite a lot of time travelling around the world looking for people to support him. Is that right, Mr. Certainly is. And I suspect, Christopher, I'm sorry for this, you have a few battles internally within the University of Oxford, a very wealthy university though it is, to justify the university investment in you. Perish the thought. So, <laughs> we're, we can't just concentrate on the traditional functions of uh, what we do, we've got to look at how we earn money and how we justify money, and it's always going to be, in my view, that tough if we're to enjoy the stability uh, that Nick referred to. But since the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of Research sneaked in the room, uh, I would like to just remind you that universities are doing very well at the moment. Yesterday, he's have published their analysis of university accounts. Uh, we'll be publishing a rather more uh, a more, a more detailed analysis in a week or so. They show that uh, this year, universities of this past year, uh, the accounts of this past year, universities have almost maintained their performance of the previous year, which was the most successful financial year ever. University income has been almost maintained. Uh, costs through, I've got to say, some very difficult decisions have been cut. Surpluses were at an all-time high in the previous year and almost maintained. If you're a horrid accountant type of person and go in for things like liquidity measures and uh, uh, you're borrowing as, you, as a percentage of your, your assets, universities are in the strongest state they've ever been. Universities are about investing for the future at the moment, but in order to create that headroom, they are willing to take tough decisions about pruning activity that isn't delivering uh, to contribute to the university mission. So, you ought to be bashing down, bashing the ears of your university management to justify that investment because in almost every university, there are some that are really in a slightly difficult situation, but in many universities, the opportunities are there to make the case. And you must not swallow the stories of university management that everything is tough. Go and read the figures. It's not that tough, but it's only not that tough because the university is asking very challenging questions. So there's a battleground on which you can fight. You have the weapons to take to the fight. Uh, go and get on with it because universities have the capability to reward you provided your case is sufficient. So universities are in a decent shape. 
Quality is key. Uh, universities are at the heart of society and use something to offer. Uh, what do we, as one of your funders, uh, quite a major funder, uh, think of university museums? And I've said positive things that uh, are all true. I thought actually, though, Chris Smith last night underplayed it slightly. He referred to the four things you do, uh, and I think they were they were all true, but he said pleasure was one of them. Pleasure, scholarship, edu education, and stewardship. All of them was true. Pleasure is not enough. We need wonder. We need excitement. I think we need to raise the horizons. And I, I, thought, I thought Chris hasn't caught up bluntly with the new challenges there are to justify activity in a funding environment that is rough. So let's raise our horizons. Now I realize as an issue, you can't keep using ever more extravagant language to justify <laughs> what you do. Uh, you've got to underpin that uh, by really solid evidence, which is indeed next all of the to impact uh, case studies where you can play a part are, are, are one of those, uh, those ways. We think you're doing a wonderful job. What you do is distinctive. It's incredibly high quality. Uh, it adds to our teaching. It's a phenomenal resource for research. All of those things are true. Unfortunately, in themselves, they're not a justification for funding in the new environment. The AHRC uh, aims of funding was uh, basically about conservation, maintenance, display, stewardship. It was about uh, the links between galleries and learning and teaching undertaken by the host institution and about increasing access to collections for benefit of both the higher education sector and the wider community. In today's tougher funding environment, the first two reasons just don't want to cut it. Universities get £9,000, most of you £9,000, any sensible, don't tweet this, any sensible university will charge £9,000 uh, per student. At that fee, the, 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 in order to generate the student loans to pay that, uh, money was taken away from us, and of course our money all went to universities, so it came to universities in a different way. You already have the money in your universities through the student fee that previously came to us and helped fund museums, galleries, and collections money. It's already in the university. The university, Ian, has probably spent it already <laughs> on other things. And that, that is one, I think, of the little problems. Would it, I, I do wonder whether it would have been wise for us to withdraw our money the day the £9,000 fee came in and point out it was already in universities. But we actually uh, were reasonably prescient and we decided that we had to have a different way of justifying uh, museums and galleries money in order uh, that you didn't all face an enormous battle with your universities for immediate uh, survival. And to that end, we changed the criteria to move to, to what Nick described, which is the benefit beyond the institution, which is something that we can still justify uh, funding. So, I, to an extent, the justification you use for the funding is a nasty tactic in order to keep doing something that you really want to do. You're going to use the money at mostly the same stuff. Of course you're reaching out very often beyond your universities, and you have to, and did, write your cases in 2010 for our review to draw attention to that so that we could continue justifying the funding. So at the present, it is couched in terms of, uh, thirdly, the widening participation, which Nick mentioned, and which I think is uh, so increasingly important for the moment, uh, for a raft of reasons that I won't go into, but you can ask me about if you, you particularly want to. Uh, Nick, Nick was just on the nail. And the first two reasons which have to do uh, with teaching and research beyond your institution. Now, you've, if you want continued funding, you've got to play that game. Uh, and of course, still, as I'll talk about in a moment, there'll be challenges about it. Uh, you must ensure that in your portfolio of activity, you do play to that mission outside the university. Of course, you've also got to play very strongly to a mission inside the university. So high cost isn't enough. 
because high cost is met through the £9,000 uh, fee. Taking a university-centric view or a museum-centric view uh, cuts no ice when you're asking now for funding on top of the student fee. It's got to be public interest in some sense, or indeed, since we're not just actually in the business of funding the public interest, we're interested in the broader higher one, of the narrower, I guess, higher education interest, you've got to couch it in those, those terms. Uh, it is, I'm afraid, about understanding the arguments that will work and trying to align what you're doing uh, with those arguments. What about the future? Nothing I say about future funding can be in any sense a commitment uh, because everything changes. I do not know what will happen. I have some ideas what will happen in the short term, I have ideas about the risks, but uh, we are all subject to uh, political pressures and funding pressures, so what I'm now about to say could change next week. But nevertheless, I'm going to say it so that you have an insight into where I'm standing and trying to make the case. The first uh, issue is that there's a spending review taking place immediately after the budget, the work has started now, uh, which is looking at rolling the four-year spending review uh, back, or rolling it forward by year so that uh, it includes 14-15. Uh, the general assumption is that that's a relatively minor review that won't lead to a complete revamp of higher education, uh, or indeed research funding, and many positive things have been said uh, about research funding uh, already as part of this review. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to wait and see what happens. It is perfectly possible that we'll face some small across the board cut because the Treasury is trying to make savings all over the place. It's also possible that we'll sustain an argument that funding should be maintained. It's incredibly unlikely that we're going to look at different streams of funding and take discretionary decisions about different streams of funding, and there's absolutely no motivation in heavy <coughs> to do so. Chief Executive, myself, or the Board are not interested in messing around with the funding when we're extending it for one year. Uh, I am very optimistic. Uh, the funding for 2013, uh, 14, 14, 15 uh, should remain subject to the fact the whole budget could be cut uh, by uh, a small percent, at least that's my worst fear, I don't have worse fears than that. Uh, if that happens then uh, everybody will face small cuts, I expect. But relative stability through the end of this now extended spending room period <coughs> is our aim and our intention, provided nothing uh, untoward intervenes. Post-election though, there will be a major spending review and we will be looking at every stream of funding uh, and challenging the need for it in the way that you always have to as part of a spending review. At that point, uh, and probably relatively little work will take place until near election time, we need to look very hard at the case. Will the current criteria do for the, uh, the next spending review? or will we be altering the criteria? At the moment, the Treasury is very, very uh, influenced by ways in which uh, universities and public sector bodies generally can, um, can harvest external income, and the leverage argument is a very important argument. Uh, it seems to me quite likely that in making the case for you, as we look uh, over the medium term, into uh, post-election and extending the new period, we'll be trying to get great examples of where uh, we've managed to support universities and museums uh, through private income only because the public income is there to support uh, the underpinning work. That's an argument we're looking to use and we'll require help with that when the time comes. But that's not a card to be played too early, so don't all rush out into, uh, into print. Let's talk together about how we manage uh, the case for spending. It seems to me uh, likely that the impact stuff can be used yet again, uh, but I think that's got to be done 
uh, rather more tactically than previously, and until we see, uh, notably how the Research Excellence Framework case studies pan out, it's difficult to say how they will be best used in spending review evidence. And I'm going to talk a, in a moment, as I finish, about uh, work with UUK, which I think can be a considerable element of our, our argument. But I think there is no motivation, uh, even looking into that medium term, not to fund the distinctive work that you do. But we have to assume that we'll be starting the argument from scratch again. And we will face comments that universities are now relatively wealthy because they're in a relatively high fee environment. Uh, to be quite honest, arts and humanities and also social science students in almost every university are very well funded to 9K fee. And uh, the Treasury are going to say, why do you need more money? And we need great answers for that. There are answers, we know those answers, but we've got to deploy that evidence together. Uh, it's been tremendously helpful for us to work with you in making the case on earlier occasions. We look forward to doing that. It's essential, in my view, that we, uh, we do that. There are political imperatives, of course, that we brought to bear. You've got uh, many good contacts which can be uh, used to stimulate public discussion about the importance uh, of what you do. Uh, but again, that's a card that if played at the wrong time can, uh, can go very wrong indeed, actually. Uh, and we've got to be uh, very sympathetic to uh, uh, politicians at the, the right time. So the funding outlook for the immediate future, subject to nothing truly awful happening to higher education, is good. The outlook beyond that, uh, there's no undue cause for panic, but nevertheless, there's a lot of work to justify uh, continuing in investment. That, I think, is as positive a story as I would give to any group in higher education. Uh, perhaps the core research funding is in a, is in a fairly strong uh, position at the moment, provided they continue to play the impact game. Uh, so I, I think we're, um, we're in a good place, but nonetheless lots of hard work. And I think uh, the case for public funding has to be set alongside continued and ideally increased investment for your universities, because they reckon that you're doing distinctive stuff. And, uh, more, and this is incredibly demanding, more private investment uh, from uh, places which are perhaps less troubled by the current financial situation uh, than some others. Now, that's the sort of crude money view of the world, which is for my job to get the money for you to go and do wonderful things. Can I talk a little bit more broadly about how you tie in with universities? I think a relatively wonderful development has been the decision that Universities Week in 2014, uh, June 2014, is that right, Ian? Ian Morton from UUK is here and critically involved in what I'm about to say. Universities UK, uh, ourselves, the research councils, uh, you, uh, the Natural History Museum, and the wider HE sector, we join it together. Uh, to build on the past success of Universities Week, coordinate another one in June 2014. The theme is the impact of university research on the lives of everyone uh, in the UK. It's an opportunity to engage, obviously, with a wider public, uh, which is, of course, what you do, uh, to demonstrate the case for continued public investment, to highlight the importance of research collaborations between universities and museums, but you've got to do something. You've got to take this opportunity to showcase uh, work and impact, Nick again was describing exactly the sort of thing uh, that is in everyone's mind. We've got to be looking, I think, that uh, during this project, which of course will be in the, the lead up to the election, we've got to look at this project to be a mass activity so that across the whole of the country we can demonstrate a local success from universities uh, engaging with the local communities, but of course, with many of you, national and international success because you have unique collections uh, which have national and international importance. Now, I think this is actually quite a tough job because we are going to have to be, in my view, more forward-looking than backward-looking in some of the stuff that we do, celebrating stuff that is solely history and heritage 
I think, won't do as part of this, although it's very, very important uh, wing. And I, I think that's easily justified. You just wander around the money exhibition here, and you look at how, although firmly embedded in uh, money through the ages, uh, you're learning lessons about uh, the present and the future. So I, it's not, not for someone like me to, uh, to sketch out the detail of uh, what you're doing, but I am calling on you as part of the responsibility of replacing our new public investment to engage with the uh, University of UK and to think how you can be actually at the heart of the presentation of university research. I think it's a great opportunity for you, but it is hard work uh, for you. And I know that many of you will already be planning exhibitions in that time scale, so it's quite demanding to fit all this in. Ian is here, uh, grab him and speak to him. Uh, the museum's group, of course, will coordinate on your behalf, but it's a wonderful opportunity for museums. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to demonstrate the value of our investment. It's a great opportunity uh, for advocacy. So, just to finish, we are, as Nick said, in generally a strong place. But just as in higher education, it's so tempting to think we've never had it so bad, because there are a continuing set of challenges, we've got to just try holding in tension uh, the optimistic view with the need to fundraise and to justify. We're in a world where, unlike the rest of the public sector, quite bluntly, there are opportunities uh, for investment, but we've got to justify them. We are giving an opportunity, collectively, to <coughs> universities next uh, week next year for you to play a major part. And we look forward uh, to working at a level of some detail with you in the run-up to the next spending review. Uh, in fact, really probably drawing naturally on from universities' work to make a compelling case uh, to government. If we have the money and we have the evidence, I expect we will have continually stable funding. Uh, we cannot guarantee <coughs> having the money, and we've got to work really hard to develop the evidence. It is always a joy to work with you, because every interaction is exciting and rewarding, because what you do is so wonderful. It's a great pleasure to do a challenging job making the case for funding when you have got so much wonderful stuff to work with. It's a privilege for me to work with you, and we're going to stick at it and continue to do it uh, for the next two or three years, and no doubt uh, longer than that. Thank you very much.